But again, I want to welcome everyone. I'm Nancy Howell. I am one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And of course, my slides are not progressing. There we are. And again, I, I welcome everyone. Um, it's going to be a great evening. We'll keep getting folks signed in as they join in. Uh, just want to mention a few things as we go along. First of all, we would like for everybody here to sign up for the Western Cuyahoga Audubon e-newsletter. We'll mention that a little bit later. Of course, becoming a member would be lovely, and you can hit our website. Um, we have lots of volunteer opportunities with Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and I'll mention that. And Christmas Bird Count 2023 is on Saturday, December 30th, and I will be talking a little bit more about that. So then we have our monthly members meeting. Uh, we try to start at 7 o'clock. Now, this month, November, we are having our Zoom meeting only, but other meetings are being held at the, um, the Fairview Park uh, Library on Lorraine Road. Uh, and that's, again, they start at 7, but they are in-person meetings. We also Zoom them out. And so if you attend, that's great in person, but we also like attendance via Zoom. Um, and that's why that said seven o'clock due to time constraints because the library uh, does close at nine and we have to be out of there. But tonight we don't have that constraint. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering for any many, many different uh, volunteer opportunities uh, with Western Cuyahoga, please, here's my email address, Nancy Howell at wcaudubon.org. We need writers for the newsletter. We need uh, people to help with education. We'd like to revive our native plant sales. Those are just a couple of the, of the things as well. So uh, please think about it. And uh, just a little of your time each month would be terrific. As I mentioned, the e-newsletter, which it comes out once a month via MailChimp, um, and you can find this, uh, what, the link on our website. And uh, they, they, the uh, e-newsletter comes once a, once a week. If you think you're getting just too darn many uh, bits of information, you can unsubscribe at any time. But of course, all of our information is 100% wonderful and great. So, and also, again, think about becoming a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And as I mentioned, the Christmas bird count will take place on December 30th. Um, as a matter of fact, our speaker program in December will be me talking about the Christmas bird count, how to participate, how to turn in your data, what our count circle is. So again, we hope that you can join us uh, for that on the first Tuesday of December, and that will be coming up. That information will be coming up a little bit, little bit later in this slideshow. And I'd like to introduce Michelle Brocious, our one of our other board members and our bird walk coordinator. Is Michelle with us? Mm-hmm. But she's not saying anything. She muted. Yeah. She muted? No, she's not, but she's not having any audio either. Oh, oh dear. Well, that does happen periodically. Uh, I know she's had a little bit of uh problems with her her computers, but anyhow, um maybe if she comes back. Yeah, why don't we go I on we'll just person and, and circle back to her? Yeah, let's just do that. All right. Ah. Drina Nemes is come on is uh, one of our Audubon members and runs our book discussion series. Drina, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes. Loud and clear. Wonderful. Okie doke. Next slide, please. Yep. Well, uh, we've had our first book discussion uh, in October, and our next one will be next year. Happy New Year. Uh, January 16th, uh, that's a Tuesday, we'll be talking about Vesper, Vesper Flights by Helen McDonald. And then in April, we'll be talking about Finding the Mother Tree by Susan Samard. Next slide, please. If you're interested, there are some YouTube videos that feature Helen McDonald, and she is quite interesting to listen to. The video that's here is, is a short one, and it introduces you to her book, Vesper Flights. It is available in both the Cuyahoga County Public and the Cleveland Public Library systems. And you can purchase it uh, at major booksellers. Next slide, please. It's so much fun if you love to read books or look at books or go to libraries. The American Birding Association has a galore of book reviews there. It's quite up to date. So the American Bird Birding Association, they have book reviews. Also 10,000 Birds has a wonderful selection of book reviews too. Next slide, please. Our good friend, David Lindo. Uh, he has a wonderful website, and his uh, interviews with authors is called In Conservation With. He has wonderful conversations with a lot of folks in the natural world who study the natural world. Um, our, our previous book in October was The Glitter in the Green by John Donne, and David Lindo does have an interview with uh, John Dunn about that book, Litter in the Grain. Next slide, please. And then um, our own series, our own book discussions, you can find uh, uh, those at this website, www.wcaaudubon.org slash book discussions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Drina. Uh, those book discussions are wonderful. They are via Zoom. They are not in person. They are via Zoom. And again, this is just the type of information that we send out on our via our e-newsletter, as well as our, our newsletter that is uh, on our website. So you may take a look at that and um, hopefully sign up for uh, one of our book discussions. Uh, before we jump to Mary Ann, I uh, just want to find out, um, Michelle, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> can, can, can I back? I'm going to back up. Yes, okay? please. Do, 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 do. Pretend you're not seeing all these slides. <laughs> all right. Okay. There we are. Okay, I next said. slide though, please. There. All right. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for your patience. I'm glad I got my audio working. Uh, so I'm just going to cover our upcoming bird walks and how you can connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. All right. Um, it's actually uh, this Saturday, November 11th. We have the second Saturday bird walk. We meet every second Saturday of the month um, at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot. Um, Bill Dunninger, Dave Gress Kemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk. Uh, last year in November, we had at least two groups of Eastern Bluebirds that were just lovely to see. We also had American Tree Sparrow and Dark Eyed Junko. Next slide, please. We also have this month, the fourth Saturday of every month, um, the Tremont Towpath Trail Urban Bird Walk. Please note it's the fourth um, Saturday and not necessarily the last Saturday um, at 9 a.m. Uh, we meet at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue. Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk. Next slide, please. And then finally, we are on Facebook, X, which is formerly Twitter, Instagram, and, and YouTube. Um, please, when you um, post a bird picture to Instagram, use hashtag WC Audubon so that we can see your photo. 
Next slide. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michelle. Appreciate it a lot. Um, our, and I just wanted to mention our towpath trail urban bird walks are a great, are great fun. Um, you know, we do the same walk every month, uh, uh, except December. We're not going to be doing December because that is our Christmas bird count. But uh, I figured, yeah, November, let's walk off that turkey dinner after eating so much, gobbling it down. So... <laughs> All right, Mary Ann. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I, yes, thank you. Um, Audubon has a project, National Audubon has a project called Climate Watch. And what it is, it's, we, it's a citizen science program that anybody can participate in. It, it occurs twice a year, once in the spring, or once in the spring and once in the winter, which the winter one is coming up. We can advance, please. The, the winter one occurs from January 15th through February 15th. We tend to have a special day, which is on going to be the third Saturday of the month. So it's not the second one for the second Saturday of the walk. And it's not the fourth one, which is the three-month walk. It's the third Saturday. When we, we if, if you want to, you can participate in the climate watch on the same day as many other people will be doing, which is going to be a big fun thing. So, you know, assuming the weather is not terribly bad. If the weather is bad, then you can do it any other time between January 15th and February 15th. And if you want more details on how to participate in this climate watch, there's my contact information, my email, and my phone number. So give me a call and let me know. It's a lot of, it's, it's very easy to participate in this, this survey. All you need to know is basically just nut hatches and goldfinch. There are several other birds that you can survey for too, but the two primary ones are goldfinches and nut hatch. So if you're interested, give me a call and I'll tell you how we how we go about doing this. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. And if you're not familiar with uh, reaching Marianne, uh, maybe you didn't get the number jotted down quickly enough, you can always write to info at wcaudubon.org and I can get that information to Marianne so we can get more participants. Uh, now, uh, Bird Friendly Coffee, Amanda Sabrowski is our coffee coordinator. She is working the polls this, this evening, so won't be able to talk about Bird Friendly Coffee, but I can. Um, we sell birds and beans, uh, Smithsonian Bird Friendly uh, coffee. It is, as you see, shade grown, organic, fair trade. I mean, it is good for people. It is good for the, the habitats that the birds need in the uh, non-breeding season. And so uh, we, and we make a little bit of a, of a profit uh, from selling the, the coffee, but it's also very, very good. We have uh, lots of different varieties, fine grind, uh, dark roast, whole bean, you name it, you can see it on our website. Now we do order four times a year. Uh, January 10th will be the where, when the next order goes in, but you can order anytime and we will just hold on to that order until boom, it gets sent in on January 10th. And the coffee is sent within a week and then we will deliver it right to your door. So there's no uh, uh, delivery fee, there's no shipping fee. Yeah, just pay for the coffee. So uh, again, it's it's very, very good. So we hope that you can think about uh, having some coffee, getting you through those dark winter uh, and cold winter nights in January, February, and March. Oh, come on. There we go. All right. Uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to talk about our December speaker program before our November one. Uh, the Christmas bird count 2023 uh, will be done by me. And again, it'll be at the library as well as via Zoom. 
and we will be talking about, again, how to participate, what our count circle is, um, how to enter your data. It's, it's very easy. Uh, sometimes people uh, go out on their own. Sometimes people go out with small groups. We have driving routes. We've got walking routes. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but remember, the Christmas bird count will take place on Saturday, December 30th. This is our speaker program, which is Tuesday, December 5th. But this evening, uh, we have our wonderful speaker, uh, Mark Wiley, with a, a wildlife biologist with ODNR, uh, talking about wild turkey management and monitoring in Ohio. Uh, as mentioned, Mark is a wildlife biologist grew up on a central Ohio farm where he resides today with his wife and three children. Mark received a Bachelor of Science degree from Ohio University and a master's degree in wildlife sciences from The Ohio State University. Mark has been with The Ohio Division of Wildlife since 2012 and his primary responsibilities include research and monitoring of forest game birds, including wild turkey. So thank you for joining us this evening. And Mark, I am going to stop my share. Boop. And I've made you co-host, so you should be able to share. Trying now. We'll hope this works. All right. Do you see my title slide? It's great. Looks fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Well, well thank you for the invitation to speak um, and, and thank you all for attending this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Um, you would think I would be used to these virtual presentations after uh, the past few years we've been through, but it still is strange to me to, to speak to my computer in an otherwise empty room, but I'll I'll, I'll do the best I can. Um, the title of my presentation this evening uh, is Wild Turkey Management and Monitoring o in Ohio. It's a very vague title because I wasn't sure uh, when I committed to this exactly what I wanted to touch on. Uh, I think in the time that I have, you could spend the entire uh, session talking about the history of wild turkey management, and, and we'll get into a little of that. You could talk about the various ways that the Division of Wildlife monitors or manages uh, wild turkey and we'll touch on 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 some of those things really just scratching the surface and then i'll wrap up talking a little bit about uh, an ongoing research project which is very exciting for us for me um, and those interested in, in wild turkey biology and management in ohio first i would like to, to present to you the mission statements for both the, the department of natural resources and within the department the division of wildlife uh, I've, I've started doing this because I encounter all sorts of misconceptions, misperceptions about what what the state wildlife agency does. Um, and so the focus that I would I would give you, I, I, uh, maybe I lean toward the department's mission statement a little bit more is to ensure that balance between wise use and protection of our natural resources. And that, that becomes vitally important in management of game species, which is my primary responsibility. Uh, that wasn't always my area of interest. In fact, some of the work that I did prior to coming to the division might be of more interest to your group, uh, songbird work in, in various states across the, the country. But I fell into game bird management. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and we'll talk about wild turkeys today. But that balance between protection and wise use is probably most apparent in our uh, um, development, implementation, and enforcement of hunting regulations for some of these game species. For, for wild turkey, a very popular game species, some of you may be familiar with, with uh, Ohio's hunting regulations, some of you not might not, so I'd like to explain just a few of them. Wild turkey are somewhat unique among Ohio's game species and that we have two uh, hunting seasons for wild turkey that essentially occur on opposite ends of the calendar. We have a spring season, uh, which occurs during the, the turkey's breeding uh, period or breeding season. Um, 
it's specifically positioned or or i should say uh, sort of uh, it's timed in a way that uh, we try to have minimal impact on breeding activity and we'll talk about about that a little bit more uh, later in the presentation i believe but essentially uh, the spring season is targeting male birds after uh, fertilization of hens has occurred. And so the removal of those adult males from the population has very little impact or should have very little impact on population growth, reproduction in that current year and growth of the population subsequently. Um, so it's a, it's a unique season in that it occurs during the, the breeding period, mating period, um, and even into the early nesting period. Um, and it's, it's by far Ohio's most popular turkey season is that spring turkey season when you, when you get the gobbling birds, the gobbling males, uh, the response to calls, uh, and, and so forth. Ohio also has a fall season, which is a much, uh, less popular or, or, uh, has far fewer hunters uh, than our spring season does. So, uh, as an example, spring season. Uh, we estimate we may have anywhere from 60 to 80,000 hunters in the state of Ohio taking taking uh, advantage of that season in the spring uh, versus fall where we issue now less than 7,000 permits um, for fall, fall hunting. Uh, I should mention a permit is required to hunt wild turkey in the state of Ohio, so you must have that, that permit in hand. Uh, and, and in that way, we can track fairly accurately uh, how many hunters are, are in the state pursuing those birds and may may have the opportunity to take a bird. I say fairly accurately because in Ohio, we have fairly liberal uh, regulations with landowners. So landowners can uh, hunt and, and take animals, game animals within season uh, without purchasing that permit that I mentioned. Uh, both seasons are roughly four weeks long. Um, I've got dates there. They're, they're, they're from the previous season. I apologize. I've not updated that, but the bag limit is the same. Uh, the difference being in the spring, uh, the bird must be bearded, which I'll explain that if that's foreign to any of you, uh, in, in, I believe one of the next slides, but largely bearded birds are all male uh more than 90 percent of of i should say more than 98 percent of our spring harvest are male birds um, whereas in the fall it's a, a bag limit of one bird of either sex meaning you could take a, a male bird or a female bird and in large part that's because uh, in that fall season many of the poults from that previous nesting season haven't developed a lot of their sexual characteristics yet, the dim dimorphism that we'll talk about in just a second. So it would be very challenging uh, to identify some of those poults as male or female. And, 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 uh, and, and so we have the either sex regulation. So as I mentioned, uh, a very popular game bird in Ohio, our most popular game bird and our largest game bird uh, with males exceeding 20 pounds, uh, in many cases, mature males. Uh, the average lifespan is roughly two to four years for a wild turkey. That's actually quite a long time from for compared to many of our other game birds, prey species for a lot of Ohio's predators. Uh, they have a polygamous uh, breeding structure. Um, spring breeders, as I mentioned, with nesting season occurring in late spring and early summer. Um, uh, the, the, the breeding system, uh, we're all probably familiar with the male uh, gobbling, but that's actually part of what, what has been described as an exploded lek. Uh, so a lek you may be familiar with more so um, in prairie grouse uh, of various species where they have a designated location on the landscape where uh, males and females congregate and the males display for the females and the females select uh, their mate. With, with wild turkey, uh, the exploded lek terminology is uh, instead of one centralized location where many birds will congregate, it's more uh, males two to or one to four to 
uh, even more may have isolated locations where they display and gobble for females and then draw those females to their their calls and displays um, where where then the the females make their uh, selections breeding occurs and then those females move off uh, to to nest uh, gobblers really only are, are there for fertilization that's that's their only biological use uh, they, they take no part in nesting or, or rearing like some of our other game birds do, northern bobwhite quail a, as an example. Um, I did my master's work on quail and the males will actually incubate and care for young uh, while the female may go off and have her own nest, a very uh, an interesting and unique feature of, of those birds. But for wild turkey, the males really only serve one purpose. And that's one of the reasons that we can have uh, this this uh, spring uh, hunting season that occurs during breeding uh, and, and and take those males out of the population, take some proportion of the males out of the population without uh, fear of impact on on the on reproduction in that year or population growth on the whole. Uh, wild turkeys are ground nesters as you might imagine, with such a large bird. Uh, and also they have large clutches of precocial young, meaning they leave the nest immediately after hatching. There's no care that happens at the nest. And really the nest is little more than a depression in the ground uh, where the hen will deposit eggs, uh, tip, a typical clutch of 11 to 12 eggs. Um, and she'll incubate for a roughly 27 to 28 days. That is the most vulnerable time uh, for, for a hen turkey. Um, that is when we see the highest mortality rates. When she's incubating those eggs, she's highly vulnerable to a lot of mammalian predators, um, where otherwise, uh, outside of the nesting season, wild turkeys will actually spend, uh, they will roost in trees, uh, sort of elevated off the ground where they're in, largely inaccessible uh, to those mammalian predators. You do see some seasonal changes in turkey behavior beyond just uh, mating occurring in the spring. Uh, so I, I mentioned uh, hens will go off and, and nest somewhat isolated uh, and alone. So that's uh, during the spring months, April, May, you may see lone gobblers, lone hens. Uh, they, they're sort of scattered across the landscape. Um, after nesting occurs, hens will start to uh, group up with other hens, either with or without poults, and they'll start to form these winter flocks. Uh, even late in the summer, these, these groups will begin to form. And so you may very well see in the late summer, two hens with eight poults or 10 poults, or four hens with, with no poults, um, if, if they've been somewhat unlucky in their nest attempts. Similar with gobblers, they'll begin to form up after the nesting season. And then through the winter, they'll be in these uh, uh, flocks that are somewhat segregated by sex and age. Uh, adult gobblers generally stay together through the winter months. Young uh, males called jakes, uh, yearling males, will generally stay together if they're not with still with the hen uh, in, the, in her winter flock. And as I mentioned, hens will come together with poults from the previous year, and they'll have these, these large hen and poult flocks through the winter. So just a, a quick, uh, you all may very well know this information, but it, it's somewhat self-serving because uh, as Nancy mentioned, I'm gonna ask for some citizen uh, participation in one of our citizen science surveys a little bit later. And I would love uh, for all of the information submitted to be, to be very accurate when it comes to uh, sex of the turkeys that you observe. Uh, so the male uh, turkey, uh, mature males often referred to as gobblers. And as I mentioned, young males, males of, of, of the, that year uh, are referred to as jakes. They have a slightly larger body. As I mentioned, they can exceed 20 pounds uh, and they, their body is generally a darker color. And that's in large part because the contour feathers on their body are black tipped. So with just a few contour feathers from the breast of the bird, you can tell the sex uh, because males have black tips. And as you'll see in just a second, uh, hens actually have brown or buffy tips on their breast feathers, uh, probably aids in their, their camouflage. Um, and then I mentioned uh, the beard 
So it's that it's that feather that you see protruding from the center of this this bird's breast, uh, and it is a feather. And for uh, I need to have it tattooed on the back of my hand. I believe it's called a monophylo plume. It is the specialized feather, uh, which which is more commonly referred to as the turkey's beard. Uh, almost all males have them. Uh, young males have a much shorter beard typically. Uh, and the mature male, like this one in the photograph, have a, a much longer beard, which is much more obvious. Uh, the head of the males uh, can be white, blue, red. Uh, they, they're able to constrict uh, blood vessels in, in, their, in uh, the skin on their head and, and generate those colors. Um, that most often occurs during spring displays when those birds are strutting and gobbling. Uh, males also have a large wattle below their bill or their beak, caruncles on their head, which are those sort of uh, lump, lumpy uh, areas of skin, although you see the rough pattern on this bird's head. Um, and then also the leader, or I've heard it referred to as a snood, uh, just on the top of the beak uh, between the eyes, which on this bird is very small, uh, typical of an, a, a bird that is alert. Uh, for some reason, uh, but in display that again, uh, through uh, vasoconstriction, uh, that that leader can actually hang down over the, the beak of this bird. And then uh, the legs of the bird, which are, are typically less obvious, uh, but males do have large spurs, uh, like a large claw on the back of their uh, back of their leg. The females uh, their body size is slightly smaller and as I mentioned, lighter color. Uh, and that's largely because the, you can see those breast feathers are buff tipped or brown tipped and hens typically lack that beard. I say typically because a small percentage of hen turkeys do have a beard. Um, it says nothing about their, their ability to reproduce or anything like that. That is a common misconception uh, for, for whatever reason that bearded hens are unable to, to reproduce or or, uh, or function as as any other hen would um, they do perfectly well there's just there's just something there's some uh, small percentage of hens that that grow that beard um, the beard of, uh, of a hen is typically much more much more slender uh, but they can be quite long uh, the most obvious thing I think for hens is the bare and blue head uh, they don't have the large caruncles or wattle and, and uh, again, that, that prominent leader uh, on top of the head. And then the legs, again, it's, it's fairly difficult to see when you're observing a wild bird, but they, the legs do typically uh, uh, lack the large spur that the males will have. So uh, the wild turkey in Ohio, uh, certainly a common fixture. I'm certain that you've all seen wild turkey. Uh, probably quite recently. I'm, I'm sure all, uh, all of you in the last year or so have, have seen wild turkeys in whatever part of the state you're from. Um, but that was not always the case. Uh, so wild turkey were actually extirpated, absent from Ohio, uh, around the turn uh, of the, the 20th century. So 1904 or 1907, uh, I forget which, the last known wild turkeys were captured and killed uh, and I believe they were consumed um, in, in southern Ohio. Um, so surely a, a native species that was once quite abundant uh, prior to European settlement, but uh, were lost largely to forest clearing, uh, the loss of their habitat when, when many Ohio's uh, uh, forests were cleared. I think we we got down to 10 to, or 12 percent forest cover at, at the low point um, in the 1800s. In the absence of, of suitable habitat, uh, turkey populations declined. And then uh, add to that unregulated hunting. Um, and I emphasize unregulated because there there is a distinct difference between what occurs today and what occurred uh, in the 18 and early 1900s. So absent from, from the state uh, at the turn of the 20th century, as I mentioned, there were several efforts to restore wild turkeys to Ohio using game farm 
birds. And by game farm, I mean commercially propagated birds. These were birds, uh, several thousand of them, actually. They looked very much like today's wild turkey. Uh, they may have been sourced from wild turkey populations, but they were raised in captivity, actually, in several farms in Pennsylvania is where we acquired most of those birds. Uh, so those releases occurred in the 40s and 50s. Again, several thousand birds were released in Ohio. Um, those releases were unsuccessful. In large part, uh, looking at biologist notes from, from the time, the birds were not wary of humans or predators at all. Uh, they were they were easily approached, um, and they also roosted on the ground, meaning they they don't they didn't act as wild birds do, and take to the trees at night. They just stayed on the ground uh, where they were easy prey for for a variety of mammalian predators. So uh, the captive propagation was unsuccessful. Very fortunately, in the 1950s. Uh, biologists were developing means of capturing wild turkeys from wild populations uh, and transporting them to the, these various states uh, that lost wild turkey. Ohio included, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan. Uh, the wild turkey range shown here in this 1959 map uh, had really contracted. Uh, so actually in 1959, Ohio was already three years into the restoration of wild turkey using wild stock. And you can see a few dark areas there in Southern Ohio. And that's where uh, the Ohio Division of Wildlife had made arrangements with states that still had wild turkey populations. And those birds were transported to Southern Ohio where we, had, where we still had some uh, substantial forest cover. So I've thrown some numbers up there uh, based on the records I have. We received 14 birds from West Virginia, 11 from Kentucky, 71 from Missouri. So Missouri, Missouri provided the bulk of Ohio's uh, restoration birds uh, or birds for, for reintroduction. Um, Arkansas pro provided nine birds, 24 from Texas, 18 from Alabama. And then we have six that came from Florida. And, I'll, I'll point out another feature of this map. There are several subspecies of wild turkey in the eastern U.S. The one that is found uh, in Ohio and in, in all of our neighboring states is referred to as the eastern wild turkey. In Florida, particularly southern Florida, there is a subspecies called Os Osceola with some slight uh, variation in plumage and behavior. Um, but actually, those six birds were believed to be Osceola. Uh, subspecies. They were released in Shawnee State Forest, if you're familiar, uh, in Scioto County in southern Ohio. Um, it's thought that the that release was unsuccessful. So I sometimes get questions about whether the restoration effort, the reintroduction effort, brought su other subspecies to Ohio. Um, it is possible, but based on the records I have, it's thought that those subspecies did not persist, and we largely have a true eastern wild turkey subspecies. I won't dwell on that too much longer because I'm afraid I'm going to go well over my time. But anyway, the restoration, the reintroduction of wild turkeys in Ohio using wild caught birds from other states amounted to only 153 birds that were brought over the course of a couple decades. And that surprises a lot of folks. It, it seems like a fairly small number to essentially restart a population. They came from all over the, the eastern U.S., um, largely from Missouri, um, but they were wildly successful when released in southeast Ohio. The first release was Vinton County. If you're familiar with Vinton Furnace State Forest, uh, the, there's, a, there's a location there. Uh, that received Ohio's first wild turkeys. I mentioned uh, this was possible because biologists at the time were developing capture methods that were previously uh, unknown using rocket nets specifically. In the top left photo shows uh, someone baiting an area with cracked corn. Wild turkeys are highly susceptible. They love cracked corn whole kernel corn, they're highly susceptible to uh, baiting in that form, which is why baiting is illegal in almost every state. When it, when you're turkey hunting, you are not permitted to put corn or other bait out for wild turkey. Uh, it draws them in fairly easily. 
top left corner is someone baiting with wild corn, an area in, in the dark area uh, to that, that person's right. There's actually a concealed rocket net, which is a large net attached to ropes. The ropes are attached to a metal. It's not a true rocket like you might picture a, a space rocket, but it's a, a essentially a large metal pipe with uh, vented holes in the back and a charge is placed inside that and set off with electricity. Um, and then the exhaust from inside that pipe leaves those vents, those vents in the back. It pulls the net up over uh, the turkeys. So you can see one of those uh, rockets in the top right uh, photo. And then you can see the net being deployed in the bottom left photo. Uh, so you see the exhaust from those rockets and then you see the net extending upward and outward over, over the, the baited area, which hopefully contains several turkeys. And then, and then those birds were transported to, to wherever they were headed. Um, so again, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, wild turkey restoration was occurring almost nationwide um, and was very successful. So by, uh, again, I mentioned the, the restoration effort in Ohio began in the 50s. By 1981, we had a sizable population of southeast and south central Ohio. You can see the dark area here and even a few areas of east central Ohio. Uh, wild turkeys had taken hold following these restoration efforts. And at this time, the, following the successful reintroduction, we the Ohio Division of Wildlife began translocating turkeys from these areas where they took hold and were doing very well. We began capturing birds in these locations and uh, helping them move across the landscape to, to other suitable habitats. Initially, we thought Biologists at the time thought turkeys would only ever occupy southeast and eastern Ohio, where we had the bulk of our forest cover. And they very quickly figured out that wild turkeys are much more adaptable than they initially thought. They started to occupy areas that had much less forest cover uh, than, it, than it was thought they needed. So map on the left, 1981. By 1988, just a, a little less than a decade later, you can see how the range had expanded. Uh, both through the, the natural movement of these birds, but also that translocation uh, from the Division of Wildlife, uh, as I mentioned. You can see, uh, uh, those of you that are familiar with West Central Ohio, a population popped up there in, in Logan County, again, an area of the state that uh, it was not thought wild turkeys could, could ever survive. The, the translocation uh, methodology was was no different than the initial reintroduction methodology using rocket nets uh, fired over bait. So you can see here division staff uh, capturing a flock of wild turkeys. Generally, uh, winter is best. Um, that, that's when turkeys will come to this bait most readily. Um, and essentially the biologists, the wildlife staff wait nearby these bait piles with a rocket ready to fire, uh, sitting out in the cold, uh, just hoping that a turkey flock will come by um, and then they're captured, boxed up for transport and moved. And, and this translocation effort occurred from the uh, early 60s all the way to the last movement of birds was 2008 when birds were moved to some west western Ohio counties, some of the highly agricultural counties. The releases were, were often public events. Uh, when birds were brought to a county or an area of a county for the first time uh, and, and released. So these often had media and politicians and dignitaries and landowners. And, and they were, they were, this was before my time with the division. Uh, but uh, I'm told that these were often uh, 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 quite the spectacle, I guess we'll say. And again, uh, highly successful. Um, so the blue area on the map here, this is a map from 2014. The blue area uh, shows the, uh, the range at, at that time of the eastern subspecies of wild turkey. And then some of the other colors show the, the, uh, some of the other wild turkey subspecies. You can see there in Florida, the orange is the range of the Osceola, uh, the six birds that, that came to Shawnee State Forest. Uh, but a broad range for the eastern subspecies 
uh, covering all of Ohio. There are a few white areas there in Ohio. Uh, the biologists at the time essentially excluded some of the highly agricultural land uh, that probably at the time did not have large wild turkey populations. Uh, but at this point, we can basically say that wild turkeys occupy the entirety of the state, all 88 counties, uh, even the most agri highly agricultural, there, the ones that have the least forest cover. And we can attribute the wild turkey's success to their adaptability and also a little bit to their mobility, uh, their ability to travel from one place to another and, and seek out new habitats. But what I've laid out here is essentially uh, what we would refer to as a, a successional diagram, with the left side being a highly disturbed area, picture a row crop field, a, a cornfield or a bean field uh, that is disturbed regularly every year, often multiple times a year. That would be on, on one end of the successional spectrum. And on the right side of this diagram would be your old growth forest or very mature forest that is disturbed at a frequency of 100 years or 150 years. And, and in Ohio, much of, much of our land want, you know, pushes toward that uh, dis mature deciduous forest within the absence of disturbance. Wild turkeys will use all of these habitats. Uh, they're what we would refer to as a forest generalist, meaning they, they're they somewhat obligated to use forest cover, uh, but they're a generalist in that they would use a wide variety of habitats, much like white-tailed deer uh, and some other species that, that are fairly common in Ohio. Now, within that, uh, throughout the year at different times or different behaviors, they will use different areas. And, and I bring this up because people often say to me, well, I, I see turkeys in the summer, but I never see them in the winter. Where do they go? Or I see turkeys in the winter, but I never see them in the spring and summer. Where do they go? Or, or why is that occurring? And often that's because the property that maybe you own or that you're observing turkeys might have one or two components of, of forest cover um, that they're using, but outside of that season, they're using something somewhere else. Um, so as an example, um, wild turkeys will really find food across the spectrum and they'll find food in agricultural fields. Uh, they'll find food in, dis in mature deciduous forests during the spring, summer, and fall. Those are periods of, of relative abundance for an opportunistic omnivore like wild turkey, meaning they'll eat whatever they can, plant, animal, uh, it doesn't really matter. They'll they'll consume it uh, if it's available to them. But in the winter, when food becomes much more restricted, uh, they'll often utilize crop fields for waste grain, or there'll be a mature deciduous forest searching for uh, things like acorns, um, which are an abundant food resource most of, most of, most years, I should say, even into the winter months. Uh, but in that in that middle stage uh, where maybe soft mass like berries uh, are, are unavailable during the winter, you're not going to find turkeys there foraging. Similar with their nesting and, and brooding uh, habitat, the orange there, uh, that's going to be the successional stages that have some amount of ground cover. Uh, for, for several reasons, the nesting hen wants to be able to hide herself, conceal herself, and then when the, her eggs hatch, she, those poults are going to be highly reliant on invertebrates, small bugs, and they need to be accessible on the ground. And you often find those in, in habitats that have uh, uh, herbaceous ground cover uh, where you're going to find a lot of those insects. I, I noted the two display areas there. Uh, bir birds will display, excuse me, display in a variety of, of habitats. But very often those males want to be seen um, so quite the opposite of the hen who wants to be concealed with her nest, those males often want to be seen. So you'll often find them in open areas like hay fields, which I would consider highly dis disturbed or mature deciduous areas with an open understory, uh, sort of a park-like uh, landscape with mature trees, but underneath uh, he, he can see and he can be seen. So across the state, uh, wild turkey abundance varies uh, quite a bit. The relative abundance uh, of wild turkeys in each county is highly dependent on, on habitat. And those of you that are familiar with the Ohio landscape can probably uh, 
draw a line between forest habitat and abundance here. The darkest counties that, that we've highlighted are the highest turkey abundance counties in the state, gray areas with what we would consider to be medium levels of turkey abundance, and then the crosshatch is low. But there are no counties where turkeys are rare or absent any any longer. And as I mentioned, uh, those of you that are familiar with forest cover in the state of Ohio can tell uh, we have our highest abundances where we have the most forest cover. It is not a perfect relationship, though, and by that I mean if you look at the graph on the right, it's showing uh, this was a postdoctoral researcher from Michigan uh, that put together this information for a number of Midwestern states, but essentially it's showing the percent forest cover on the x-axis across the bottom of the graph, and then on the y-axis going vertically, um, it shows the, the predicted spring harvest. And the spring harvest uh, total is, is a good indicator of wild turkey abundance. The higher the abundance, it's perceived the higher um, the spring, excuse me, the, the higher the spring harvest, it's perceived as an indicator of high abundance within that area. So essentially what you see is as you look at regions of Ohio, uh, going from zero uh, percent forest cover up to 40 percent forest cover roughly, you see increasing wild turkey abundance as indicated by spring harvest. But at that point, of roughly 40 percent forest cover, uh, you don't see any additional increase as we go as we go higher. So from 40 to 80 percent forest cover, there's no real difference. So uh, sort of the wild turkeys reach a maximum uh, abundance there somewhere in that in that range. And and to a degree, um, that open land, that cropland, um, those highly disturbed areas can be very advantageous for wild turkey. And actually, some of the counties where wild turkey abundance reaches its highest in uh, east central Ohio are areas that have almost a 50-50 mix of forest cover and agricultural land. And then uh, I'd also talk a little bit about wild turkey abundance through time. We, we, we discussed that a little bit with the maps earlier, but I mentioned spring harvest is a great indicator of uh, overall turkey abundance in the state. Um, and I'll break this graph down, which shows spring turkey permits in the gray bars and spring turkey harvest in the red bars. And the first wild turkey season, uh, modern wild turkey season in Ohio was 1966, and that's where we begin our graph on the, the left end. Um, and this goes all the way through the, the 2023 season recently concluded uh, this spring. But I'm going to break this down into two parts. There is what I would consider the restoration era, uh, meaning the wild turkey population was still growing and growing very rapidly during this period. Um, every year we were seeing uh, more and more wild turkey uh, harvest and believe, well, of course, given the success of the restoration, we were seeing a growing wild turkey population. We reached our peak in about 2000, 2001. Um, and since that time, the population appears to have stabilized and, and we see some fluctuation year or year, I was going to say year to year, but it's really more of a three to five year oscillation. Um, and it's, it's thought uh, this is largely due to uh, variation in reproductive success. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. So uh, we'll, I guess we'll talk about it right now. Yeah, we'll jump right into the wild turkey brood survey. And we talked about oscillation in wild turkey abundance as indicated by spring harvest. Um, it's thought that that is largely driven by reproductive success. And what you're looking at here is our wild turkey brood survey, which occurs every summer, the late summer, July and August. And we solicit observations of uh, wild turkeys, all wild turkeys, not just hens and poults, uh, but any wild turkeys ob observed during the months of July and August. And that's that data goes into uh, 
uh, this index, which is essentially the average number of poults per hen for that season. Uh, and so what you see here is that data uh, from 1999 to, to 2023. Uh, the 10 year average in, in the most recent decade is about 2.7 poults per hen. And you can see that's been fairly stable during this period with the exception of a few notable years, 1999, 2008, uh, 2016 were all extremely high uh, years for the number of poults per hen. And some of those, some of you may recognize those years as periodical cicada emergence years. Uh, 1999 and 2016 are 17 years apart. Uh, that is the 17 year emergence of the southeastern brood of periodical cicadas, um, one of Ohio's largest emergences. Uh, uh, of periodical cicadas. 2008 is actually the southwestern region's uh, periodical cicada emergence. And if you all are unfamiliar with these uh, events, I'd highly recommend traveling to see one when they occur. Um, <clears throat> the next will actually be southwest Ohio, that 2018, or excuse me, 2008 emergence will occur 17 years later, which will be 2025, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but Northeast Ohio has has some periodical cicada emergences as well. They largely occur in Pennsylvania, but I think they, they sneak their way into Eastern Ohio in that Northeast corner. Anyway, uh, these events have a tremendous impact on the number of poults uh, that survive um, for whatever reason. This could be because their primary food source is invertebrates. Um, so it's an abundant food source during a, a key time in pulp development. It could also be um, that pulp predators are gorging themselves on periodical cicadas um, and aren't chasing pulps and consuming them. Likely it's a combination of the two, but what, what we do know is when we have these periodical cicada emergence events, we see these huge surges of pulp numbers. Uh, but anyway, uh, getting back to it, most years were typically around that 2.7 pults per hen average. I'll point out a little bit later uh, some of the oddities that have occurred in the most recent decade. Uh, but most notable for us right now, I guess, is those, those periodical cicada emergencies. So this data is tremendously valuable to me as I'm often asked to predict what may occur in upcoming years, not only in, in wild turkey abundance or population trend, um, but in the spring season, uh, as it is a very popular season. There, there's a lot of uh, uh, questions about how will next season be. Um, the pult data is tremendously useful in this regard. And what I've shown you here, uh, the, the black uh, line, is our spring permit success rate, which is actually a much more useful indicator of wild turkey abundance than just total harvest for a variety of reasons. You may recall in that total harvest graph, uh, I show the permit number, and that reached about 90,000 at our peak in the early 2000s, and since that time has dropped by about 30 to 40 percent. So we're losing hunters constantly. Uh, so one would expect that uh, with fewer hunters, almost a third fewer hunters um, over the last 20 years, we're, our, our spring harvest total is going to decline. But if we look at their success rate, the average success rate of an individual hunter, it's much more indicative of what the, what the turkey abundance might be. So that black line is, is uh, permit, spring permit success rate. Um, and it's, in, it, it's, um, it's on the axis on the left side, excuse me. So uh, average is right around 22 to 23% success rate. In good years, it reaches almost to 30%. Um, and then what I've uh, underlaid or overlaid with on that, that line is the pulp data for the corresponding years. And what I expect from you folks is that this doesn't look like it makes a lot of sense. Um, and you guys are kind of guinea pigs for me. Uh, because I've I've jumped right to the end of what this three slide series for most folks, and they tell me it's very confusing. So I, I've put in some animations to try to clarify this. So essentially, the spring hunter is targeting mature male turkeys, not young of the year. 
um, not those, not typically the jakes that were hatched that that previous nesting season. So there's a two-year lag in a good poult year or a bad poult year and the corresponding change in permit success. So what I'm going to do is shift our poult data over two years, and hopefully uh, that will be apparent. And you'll see that we see a much more, uh, we see much more harmony, I guess, in, in these two data sets when, they're, when, you sh when you correct for that two year lag. So essentially this is why that pulp data is so valuable to us is this gives us an indication of what's occurring with the, the wild turkey population. And that corresponds to what we see in the spring turkey harvest. So in recent years, um, we've been on an upswing. Um, we had an excellent pulp year um, in 2021, which on this graph shows for 2023, again, two years later, um, and we saw quite an upswing in spring permit success, suggesting that turkey abundance uh, is increasing. Now, for the next two years, um, poult data was a little bit uh, lower, and I anticipate spring permit success is going to decline slightly as well, suggesting that we're going to come off that peak of abundance recently. Uh, I'll put in the plug for our, our brood survey uh, data submission. Uh, you can submit wild turkey observations again during the months of July and August. Those are the two only two months that we want that data. Um, you can submit those on our website, wildohio.gov, or if you have our app, uh, Hunt Fish Ohio, I believe is the name of it. Um, I should have that memorized. But when you observe wild turkeys during those months, uh, we would love for you to submit those observations to us and contribute to this data set. Uh, again, annual data from the Polt, uh, Polt survey. So I, I get some idea of regional trends in, in wild turkey observations. You can see your district there in Northeast Ohio always does very well. Uh, I think you exceed, uh, you have 935 observations from 2023 and that might exceed all four other regions of the state. You actually had a very good pulp per hen ratio, 3.0, which is above average. Yeah. Was there a question there? Oh, okay. Uh, all the states that you see, I'll, I'll try to speed up because I, I probably am exceeding my time. Uh, all the states you see there on the bottom uh, conduct a similar brood survey. Um, and then we can compare data across uh, across uh, all those states, which is tremendously valuable. We have the same protocol. We collect data in the same way. Um, you can see Ohio is over there on toward the right side. We're nestled right next to Pennsylvania and Indiana, our neighbors, which makes sense um, for, for regional changes in, in poll numbers. So I want to highlight uh, sort of an oddity I, I mentioned earlier when we were looking at this pulp data. Um, 2017, 18, and 19 were notably low years in pulp numbers. And individually, the, the pulp numbers were not uh, alarmingly low. But what was unusual is to have three extremely low years consecutively. And we had not seen that in the prior two decades, as you can see with with data. We generally would have a bad year and followed by an average year or a good year, and they would offset each other. And so this was somewhat alarming, uh, not only to us, but uh, to the hunting community as they began to see wild turkey abundance drop um, in the years that followed. And this prompted uh, some interest, not only in Ohio, but in some neighboring states that experienced the same decline same type of decline, maybe not exactly what we saw, um, but it, it prompted some interest in wild turkey reproduction within the region. And so what I'm showing you here is, is a map of study sites in a multi-state collaborative study, uh, a research project which is monitoring wild turkey hens uh, this, current, this uh, past nesting season and, and possibly for the next two nesting seasons. So there are study sites in Eastern Ohio, and um, we've actually identified a new site there in Northeast Ohio or sort of in the Grand River area that will monitor hens next uh, year. 
And then there are multiple study sites in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and also Maryland. And the value of that, uh, as, as you might imagine, is is much greater than than a standalone study in the state of Ohio. We can we can better compare uh, the rates that we're that we're examining, um, which include. Again, this is a hen focused study, but include hen survival and also uh, nest success, two things that that largely contribute to recruitment of new poults to the population. <clears throat> so again, uh, capture is the same. I'll jump through these. Um, this was a capture from last winter of a couple hens in an area. Uh, our staff attach GPS transmitters to these birds. They sit on their back with a strap that goes around their wing like a little backpack. Uh, and then we have an OSU graduate student that's following these birds. Um, monitors not only their movement, but all their nesting activity and follows up with them uh, if, if he gets an indication that they've, they've uh, been predated or otherwise are deceased. Um, again, the backpack uh, just kind of sits on their, uh, uh, in between their wings. It's pretty quickly preened into their feathers and unnoticeable. It's a, it's, the weight is less than 2% of their body weight, I believe. Um, so well under the recommended uh, weight. Uh, and that's actually our, our graduate student at OSU attaching that transmitter to that hen. Uh, birds are released in groups, which aids their survival. Uh, they're, they're held for only as long as it takes to get the transmitters on, but uh, they are released back in, in small groups uh, with the same birds they were captured with in the same location. And then again, this is the data that some of the, what the data that the trans, or the, excuse me, the, the graduate student sees from those transmitters. So as an example, this was a hen that was captured in the winter, this past winter, um, so probably February or March 2023, and this is some of her pre-nesting movement over a large area in East Central Ohio. I apologize, there's not a scale in here, um, but large movements. She's probably breeding over this time, searching out nesting locations, um, and then as we move into her nesting behavior, you'll see two large clusters of red lines. The one on the left is her nest location, and the one on the right is actually where she was roosting during her laying period. So she had a, a, a sort of a, a roosting area that she was uh, uh, using quite frequently during the laying period. And you see some movements away from the nest at times. They do take recesses uh, during the incubation period, or maybe it was early in the, or late in the laying period. But you see a lot of attention focused on that nest location where, again, she spent 27 to 28 days incubating. And this bird was actually 8.8 .8 kilometers from her capture location. That was her nest location. So I mentioned how mobile these birds are. Somebody will have to help me in the conversion to miles. But I know we had one bird move uh, five and a half miles uh, from her capture location to nest. So maybe 8.8 .8 kilometers gets to maybe that was this bird. <clears throat> and then we followed this bird. This bird was successful uh, nesting. Uh, and so we were able to get a track from this bird with her brood. Uh, so you can see on the left side there, that was her nest location, that little red cluster. And then she took a path through a forested area, uh, followed a, a road for a bit of a ways um, over the course of, I, I think she had these brood, this brood on the move for several days. And then she found an area there on the top right uh, where you see the largest cluster or tangle of, of red lines. That's where she essentially kept her brood for several weeks, I believe. So she found a good area of, of good brooding habitat, and she just basically stuck there with her brood. Uh, nest locations, we're learning a lot about nesting habitat, nesting behavior. I'll just skim over this real quickly. These are three examples of nest locations for wild turkey. The one on the left is a mature forest in Athens County, and that bird had absolutely no uh, concealing cover. Um, so we can do all we want to say to, to paint a picture of what ideal nesting cover is, but these birds kind of just make their own decisions about where they're going to nest. And this bird was just wide at the, out in the wide open at the base of a, a large tree. Unfortunately, that nest did fail um, and it, it wasn't predated as you see there. She abandoned for some other reason. Um, in the middle, one of the researchers is standing very near a nest bowl. Uh, and that one, I believe, was actually in a multiflora rose cluster. And that hen 
as best we could tell, had to almost belly crawl into the nest location. So it was very well concealed um, and she had very good protective cover around her, but that nest was predated, um, unfortunately. And then the nest on the far right was actually in a hay field. Um, and this was the only one of the three that was successful. The, the nest hatched the day before this hay field was cut and the hen took her poults out of the hay field um, again, just before, before it, it was cut. And, and you can see there the researchers found the nest bowl uh, after the hay was cut. So very quick, uh, I, I apologize for how long I've gone here, but uh, a quick summary of, of this per, this past nesting season. Uh, we tagged 49 hens. A number of them were censored because of transmitter failure and so forth. We had 10 mortalities, which is actually very good. We had a very good hen survival rate compared to our the uh, the other states that are in this study. Uh, we had 58 total nest attempts. Several birds attempted as many as three nests. Uh, the number, we only had nine nests successfully hatched. So we had a very low nest success rate. And we're trying to under, better understand that. Our hen survival rate was higher than other states, but our nest success rate was lower. Um, and, and we have some hypotheses for how, what, why that could be. We only had five hens that still had poults. Uh, so of those nine, we only had five that still had poults at two weeks post-hatch. We only had three hens that still had poults at four weeks post-hatch. So unfortunately, we saw some poor uh, apparent poult survival during the study as well. Uh, again, there's another measure of hen nest success, roughly 20%, um, and brood success uh, even lower. So good survival, but poor nesting uh, success. And with that, I'll take any questions if we've got anybody uh, still left after I exceeded my time by 20 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. Um, what we can do, uh, let's see, I don't see any questions. Uh, oh, here's a question. Um, Perhaps I missed information about turkeys' wanderings. Do they stay in the same general area or just keep moving around? Um, so they are capable of very long movements, as we as we talked about. But uh, when not moving for some reason, either during the breeding season or to find a nest location, they will generally stick to a location. Um, so in the winter, as an example, all they really need is a safe roost location, uh, which is often large mature trees with horizontal branches and sort of an open area where that large bird can get up to the branch um, and a food source. And if they have those things, they have no reason to, to go anywhere else. Uh, I don't know if there's other questions coming in. Let me take a look. Uh, are are would, I'm guessing the somebody's asking are they good to eat the turkeys wild turkeys? They are very good. Yes, they, they don't taste exactly like your store bought turkey, but it's very close. Uh, yeah, but they they are they're very good to eat. A little more lean and tough, I'll say. Now the three years that you mentioned of low turkey reproduction or rate, whatever, or their numbers were lower. Uh, West Nile virus, avian influenza, are those uh, possibilities very, or do we not know yet? Very good hypotheses. Um, so Pennsylvania has actually done some work on um, both West Nile virus and avian influenza and wild turkey. Um, with West Nile virus specifically, they found almost no impact on wild turkeys. Um, and that was a challenge study using wild turkey poults taken from the wild. Um, they did the same study with rough grouse, and they found an extremely high mortality rate in rough grouse. So West Nile virus appears to impact birds and even gallinaceous birds like grouse and turkey very differently. Uh, so to our knowledge, uh, those three years were not a disease event, uh, anything that we have evidence of. Uh, often what you'll see the, the primary factors impacting poult numbers are uh, weather and predation. And those two things play off of each other. In poor weather, you often have high rates of predation. 
and, and habitat impacts those things as well. But uh, when you see a, a, a notable depression in just a few years with a return to normal shortly thereafter, you start to think about things more like weather events, um, specifically anything, uh, any uh, large widespread inclement weather events or overly wet, cold, or even hot weather. Uh, those sorts of things can have broad scale impacts on ground nesting birds. So what's the estimated uh, Ohio wild turkey population now? Yes, very good question. Um, and uh, I think I've made a note for myself to to emphasize that we don't know. Uh, we yeah, we don't know exactly how many turkeys there are in the state. We don't know how exactly how many turkeys there are in each county. And that's one of the reasons that those indices of abundance and reproduction are so important is it it tells us that we don't know the total number. It tells us the trend. And as long as those trends, sort of offset each other the good years are are, are offsetting the, the bad or the bad years are offset by good years um we can be somewhat confident that the turkey population is in good shape we used to have a, a good metric for estimates of population and you probably have seen estimates of the population size even from me um, but they were harvest based metrics essentially we knew the approximate harvest rate of turkeys and we knew the the makeup of turkey the turkey population and we so we could sort of calculate what the population size would would be um, at a certain harvest rate and with a certain uh, sex ratio we made some regulation changes in recent years uh, 2022 uh, we reduced the bag limit from two to to one um, in light of, of of those poor reproductive years. And so that kind of threw a hitch in that calculation. Uh, hunters are no longer harvesting as many birds as they were when we when we made some of those estimates. So it's a long answer to say we're not sure. But tip in those in those years where we were more confident in our ability to estimate, it was anywhere from 150,000 turkeys to 200,000 turkeys. So as you know, up here around Northeast Ohio, around the Cleveland area, we're highly urban, suburbanized. Um, I know a lot of folks do have turkeys around their neighbor. I mean, they are walking through backyards, front yards, garages, that kind of stuff. Of course, we have the Cleveland Metro Parks, which is, uh, you know, nicely forested, diverse habitats. And then the Cuyahoga Valley that runs between Cleveland and Akron. So um, these brood surveys or the surveys, this would be useful even in these highly urbanized and suburbanized areas? It, it is, yes. Uh, now I'll say um, my general recommendation to people is if they feel like they've observed the same birds multiple times to only report them once. Um, and so in those those highly urbanized areas, a park or a backyard or whatever the case might be. If, if you're fairly confident that these are the same birds and you're observing them multiple times, just report them one time. Good to know. Again, if anyone has one more quick question, toss it in the chat or unmute and, and uh, ask the question, that would be fine. No? Well, Mark, we thank you so much for your time, for your information, and I hope uh, some of our folks do turn in some data that will be helpful and useful. Uh, but thank you again for your time, and thank you folks for joining us this evening. I want to wish everyone a, a great holiday season, and uh, please join us for our December speaker series, me, talking about the Christmas bird count. Thank you, everyone. Good night.